So, the media that we talked about in the prior chapters, television, radio, print media, all of those, those were sort of the ones that have dominated the IMC plans of the major, large advertisers for a long period of time. And I don't know why they call this support media, because a lot of these are very traditional, and they've been around for a long time, and for many, many, many um, companies throughout history, these have been the only things that they have relied on. Local restaurants and things like that have relied on billboards or signage outside for, for a long time. But because they have sort of taken a back seat to those more sophisticated, more advanced media, they are referred to as support media. Many small firms rely on these as their maybe sole, uh, sole source of marketing communication with their customers. Lots of restaurants, for example, lots of local restaurants, all they have maybe is their sign out by the road or maybe a billboard on the highway or those signs that you can pay for by the state that tell you what restaurants, those are, the state actually makes money off those, did you know that? That tell you which hotels and things like that are at the next. And for example, there's a gathering restaurant called El Rodeo that has uh, signs on both the south and the north exit in Guthrie, and that's all they do. That's they have one sign, sort of by their restaurant on the street that they're on, and then they have a sign on these these uh, state-sponsored uh, signs that tell you what services are available at those exits. So it's also been referred to in other textbooks and in other places. Support media are referred to by different names. So you might hear them referred to as alternative media, below the line media, non-measured media, which is sort of a misnomer because there are attempts now to measure some of the impact of these or non-traditional media. Those are some of the names that, that have been used in other textbooks and other things. So out-of-home advertising, traditional support media, out-of-home advertising, billboards, and your text tells you that both billboards and street furniture make up the majority of this type of advertising. But if you look at the pie chart in figure 13.2 or 13-2, what actually makes up the majority? I mean, by itself, it makes up the majority of the traditional out-of-home support media. What's that pie chart show? Nobody has the text. Nobody's read the text. That book is huge. That book is huge. Well, my bag of lucid just thinking a three-inch binder. <laughs> <laughs> How many of you don't have the book? This could be a problem for you. Billboards account for 65% of out of out of home advertising. Place-based uh, media, things like the banners that you see in sporting arenas, uh, signage at the Oklahoma City Dodgers, for those of you who've been there. Then transit, things like buses and taxis. Um, as I said, billboards and street furniture are the majority of this category. Billboards themselves are the majority, they make up 65%. This is one of the most pervasive forms of media in urban areas. So the more rural the area, the less maybe you will see as, as much of this. It may not be as pervasive if you live out on the farm, but if you live in an urban area, just think about New York City. How many of you have been to New York City? Three or four of you have been to New York City. If you go to uh, 
Um, what's the big media center of the vortex in the in the city of New York City? Times Square. If you go to Times Square, it's nothing. In fact, if you look at the cover of most principles of marketing texts that we use, the majority of us that teach principles of marketing, I think, use the McGraw Hill textbook, and it's got this picture of Times Square with all of the media, and that's what a lot of people think of when you talk about marketing. It's that iconic area, and there's all this. Yeah, they're huge. There are huge LCD and LED screens. There's banner ads that are going. You see the taxi cabs going by. Every cab will have some advertisement on it. The buses will have some advertisement on it. Um, in Oklahoma City, one of the things that we've done is we've started letting the city has put up these banner brackets on the poles, and that you can pay to have your advertisement put up for various film festivals or various uh, events that you're hosting around the city. And that was actually an interesting case that came out of Oklahoma City because Oklahoma City, before the gay rights movement really got going, they put up these brackets and they wanted to not allow, allow the Pride Committee to put up their banners on the brackets uh, on Classen Boulevard and the mayor of Oklahoma City said that that was not going to be allowed and they were, they were roundly slapped down by um, Vicki Miles LaGrange, a district judge here in Oklahoma City uh, in the Western District. So those are all kinds. Um, digital out-of-home media is now becoming uh, more and more prevalent. And you can see these all over uh, the interstates in Oklahoma. They're fascinating. The thing that annoys me about them is I'll see something and I'll be too far away to really see it clearly and I'll want to know what's on the app. And it has changed by the time I get close enough and you go zooming right past and you don't see it. Right? And it doesn't play again. So then there's place-based out-of-home media. This is things like aerial advertising. When I was a kid, they used to do a lot more skywriting than they do now. How many of you have actually seen somebody do skywriting? I haven't seen it in a long time. They used to do an over-the-air show. There used to be called something called Aerospace America at Royal Rogers. Is that just where they the airport? Have, like, the... They'll have an airplane that the, does the... the like actually know, the oh, I haven't seen it, I haven't seen it like that. They will actually have an airplane that does sky riding. And Coppertown used to do this over the beach areas in LA uh, a lot to get people to remind them that they should put on their scut their sunscreen. Um, it is it is more difficult to do in Oklahoma where we have a lot of wind. But they used to do it for Aerospace America, and then we had several fatality air crashes, mid-air collisions, and Aerospace America went the way of the dodo. So, but you still see it in some places. Also, airplanes with banners. Blimps, the Goodyear Blimp is one of the most iconic sorts of aerial advertising that you see all the time over what? Football games. Football games, stadiums. Um, then mobile billboards, things like car wraps. And there are companies now that if you will put a wrap on your car, they'll pay for your gas. And I had a company that uh, we did that at, a, at the American Education Corporation. If you'd agree to put a wrap on your car, we would, we would pay for a certain amount of your gas every single month. And at the time, gas was about $5 a gallon. And so there were, there were lots of people, and we only needed just a few of them, but there were lots of people in the company, but all of a sudden we're signing up to do that. And then in-store media, displays, cart signs, in-store TVs. Um, BMRB International Research suggests that one third of shoppers say that in-store ads influence their purchasing decision making. And I would suggest to you that it's probably more than that because we, we don't think that we're being influenced, but we really are. When we switched over, one of the most effective ones that I remember was when we switched over or we're about to switch over from three to beer to six point or high point beer, all of the stores did huge displays and were giving huge discounts in those displays or having coupons available at the register. They had on the display, you know, $4 off the register to try and get people to buy that three, two supply up because the minute October one hit, what happened? You got the better beer. You got the better beer and that beer is basically worthless to them. They, yeah. They're not going to be able to sell it. Yeah. And, and, and a lot of places had to sell the three, two before they start selling six. Yeah. So, like, so you have to physically get it out of your out of your space. So they were giving huge discounts. 
Because there was no beer for like two weeks. Yeah. I, yeah. I do. When they put up the ad that they had $4 off coupons at the register, I bought like eight cases. Of those <laughs> I was there with my shopping cart. You know, yeah, I, was, I, was, I was stocked up and ready. Memorial had $5 and four And they ran out. And my friend, who's actually the marketing manager for Sam's, one day came home. She moved here from New Orleans and she was living with me for about two months until she bought her house and closed on it and got all over furniture moved in. And so she's the district manager for all the Sam stores in Oklahoma City, Lawton and Wichita Falls. And she had a woman like come unglued because she had a birthday party. And she's like, I'm sorry, we're out of beer. And we can't, we just, they weren't making any more three, two, and they couldn't get, they could not get the six point in at that point. Yeah. You couldn't sell it. It was your, it was not legal. And a lot of the restaurants actually hadn't changed over. They didn't get the license in time because there was a backlog in the licensing. And so I remember going to a Mexican restaurant together and they had no beer. And I was like, no, I can't eat Mexican food. No. Cerveza. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. What? Are you crazy? I'm leaving. See ya. Transit advertising using buses, subways, truck side, taxis, car wraps, things like that. A big thing now is to actually get digital transit that they're putting on all of these things. How many of you have been to an airport that has, we had, we're in one in Minneapolis about two weeks ago, and they had digital signage up in the um, little shuttle between the terminals that we were at. And they had LED uh, video screens in the Minneapolis St. Paul thing. So those are a big, big thing. We have done that in uh, for UCL, we put our MBA, and I really wonder if they've done any kind of study or any kind of research on how many people we've, we've advertised our MBA downtown in the airport. And I don't know. I'm, I just kind of the last dean was a big proponent of this, and I kept saying, "Have you measured how many people we're getting? Have you asked how many of our like are coming to our MBA because of our signs at the Will Rogers World Airport?" I'm not thinking that that's really an effective way. What might be more effective than the Will Rogers World Airport? Than stupid MBA program signs. Banners for Subway that's actually in the terminal, stuff like that, that you might, you know, might bring you to eat. I think, I don't know. Um, inside cards, these are now often on digital screens. A lot of the retailers are now going to this where they can actually change the digital displays and specials on those, on those, scene, on those screens that are using LED screens for those, and so they're often digital now in buses, trains, and restaurants. Outside posters, of course, appear on the sides, backs, roofs of buses, cabs, cars. And again, a lot of these are now going digital, and they are doing things in a lot of cities, like New York City, where they're actually, they can monitor where the cab is going and switch the display based on the area of town that the cab is in. So that it makes more sense if you're if you're in um, sort of you know little Italy to have things that would be of interest there to see. And then of course there are stations, uh, train stations, platform posty posters, and terminal posters, and things like that that you see in, uh, in airports. The advantages of out of home advertising. You can get wide coverage of local markets, particularly in places like Chicago and New York City, where you have lots of cabs running around, you have lots of buses running around, you can put your stuff on those, particularly you see in places like New York and Chicago ads for on the buses and cabs for the latest Broadway shows or off-Broadway shows that are playing. That's pretty uh, common. You get a lot of frequency you have a lot of geographic flexibility. Obviously, nobody cares in Oklahoma City if The Lion King is playing on Broadway in New York City, but they do in New York City, so you can be selective and selecting the transit modules that you want, the areas that you want to do that. You can have a lot of creativity. I remember some of the most creative ones in New York City when Sex and the City was really a big popular show. Had lots of Sex and the City when I'd go visit my brother's Sex and the City uh, ads on the buses. They're efficient. In terms of effectiveness, about 35% of consumers say that at some point they have called a number that they have seen 
on out of home advertising. And because of technology and the LED and the, and the rapid development in that area with web-based capabilities, uh, the production capabilities have allowed us to change those fairly quickly. It didn't used to be that way. In the past, you had to have these sort of posters made up and placards made up, and they were sort of expensive to produce, and you had to put them on. But in, in the modern times, these can be produced rather, rather quickly. And you can make them very timely. So when the show goes off, it's easy to take them off the buses, particularly if they are electronic, and change them for the next show that's coming up. The disadvantages of out of home. You have a lot of wasted coverage. If you're putting it on taxi cabs and buses in New York City, you're going to have a lot of people that are seeing it that just care not. When those of you who went to New York City visited, how many of you went to a play in New York? One, two, three. What is the rock dance considered? Because I went there when I was That's a show. Okay. Yeah, that's some kind like of it's a show. show. Yeah, so that's some kind of uh, entertainment venue. Um, you know, people in New York City, depending on what sort of socioeconomic status you are, not maybe interested in going. And if you have access to it, it's one of those things that uh, a lot of people, if you have constant access to it, you may not go as often as, as you, you can because you think, well, it's always going to be there. You have limited message capabilities, particularly based on the speed of cars in places like the highway and roadway. You can actually wear out customers. If you go into Times Square in New York City, the amount, it's impressive to look at, but you've got a lot of clutter there, and it's overwhelming. And so you might ignore it. The cost, the CPM is actually maybe higher than the actual CPM for other things like television. And there are, of course, measurement problems. One of the things that's nice about doing everything on the web and tracking everything on the web is that you can get pretty accurate measures. You can tell if people are clicking through on an ad and then if they actually buy, can't you? I mean, that's fairly easy to measure. It's hard to measure if somebody sees something on a bus going by and thinks, God, I'd really like to see that. What are some of the recent plays that have come out that they might have advertised? Things like the Book of Mormon. And it's hard to tell if they saw it, you know, based on the, the bus ad or something in print or if they just heard it word of mouth. And then you can have image problems associated with it. If the, uh, if the venue doesn't meet uh, sort of the standards, you can have a, a degrading, or what we would call in trademark, a dilution of your brand equity. So the advantages of transit. The average person who lives in a major metropolitan area that uses mass transit spends 45 minutes a day on that mass transit. So in New York City, you spend 45 minutes a day on average on subways or buses or some kind of mass transit. So you've got a fairly captive audience. Uh, they're fairly routine. So in frequency, um, the routines are pretty standard in most urban areas. People get up in the morning, they go out of their co-op or their apartment in New York City, and they take the same sort of route to work the same way. And so you can get a lot of frequency and the cost is generally pretty low because they're just supplementing. That's not the primary way. First of all, the New York subway system, the New York City subway system is built with public money. And so they're not really in the business necessarily to make money. And so the costs are generally low. The disadvantages are in places like Oklahoma City. How many people actually use mass transit? Well, we have mass transit. I was going to use it when I lived in Edgemere Park. I thought it would be interesting to save the environment since I drive a big gas guzzling truck to maybe ride the bus because there was a bus stop right outside my house in Edgemere because I lived on Walker, on a corner in Walker, and there was a bus stop right there. And so I, when they started, I got the schedule and I looked at 
it, it would have I would have had to have gotten on the bus in order to take advantage of that and save our natural resources and not pollute the world with my Dodge Ram 3500 or my Ford F-350 at the time. I would have had to have gotten up at 5 a.m. in the morning so that I could be at the bus stop at 5.30. And then it took from 5.30 until about 7.45 for me to get here from my office hours at 8 o'clock. So not terribly efficient in places like Oklahoma City. And so how many people actually ride them in places? Even it's not it's not even rural. Oklahoma City is urban. It's just that we're so spread out. I mean, we're much bigger, our geographic area here. At one point in time, Oklahoma City was the largest geographic SMSA that stands for Standard Metropolitan Statistical Area, which they've now shortened to just MSA, Metropolitan Statistical Area, in the country because we were so spread out. Where does the Oklahoma City metro go? I think Houston has actually surpassed us in terms of geographic size. Well, Oklahoma City, the furthest part of the standard metro, what they used to call the SMSA or now the MSA, goes all the way to Purcell, which is a little bit south of Norman, and all the way north on the north end to Guthrie. That was what was part of the Association of Central Oklahoma Government's COG region. And then in the eastern part of the SMSA, it goes all the way almost to Shawnee. Like the Choctaw, isn't it? To Choctaw, which is almost to Shawnee. So it will someday include Shawnee. And then in the west, it goes all the way to what? Oh, Is that pretty close to It goes on I-40. If you're talking about I-40, it goes oh. all the way to El Rio. Okay. So okay. that's about, if you take it from east to west, it's about 65 miles. And you take it from north to south, it's about 60 miles. That's the SMSA. We have how many people in the MSA? in the Oklahoma City area. About a million. New York is far smaller than that area. And how many people do they have in New York City? Seven. You know, like seven million. Isn't that the size of like Edmond? Like as far as size goes? New York City? I think only 50. I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's that small, but it, I mean, because if you include Staten Island, it's pretty big. But it's certainly not anything compared to the geography City. And, I, and also included in the new in the New York metropolitan statistical area is also Jersey City, which is across the river, um, and some of the other suburbs in New Jersey. So it's it's uh, it's a not as it's not as small as maybe Edmond, but it's it's considerably it can fit comfortably in uh, a corner of the Oklahoma City MSA. So. In rural areas or suburban areas, it may not be this is what is it say? 8.5 million in the New York metropolitan area. The mood of the, uh, of the audience can also be a big disadvantage. What are people in New York City in the morning on the subway? How many of you have been in New York City on the subway in the morning? I know this is going to be hard for you because you don't wake up in the morning. You're at that age where you sleep, you know, till noon. I wish I could do that. I used to be able to do that in my 20s. I could just sleep until noon, just like Josh I Gabor. Not anymore. I'm up at 5. Wide awake. Wide awake at 5 a.m. every day. It's horrible. Yeah, even when I don't need to be. I'm wide awake at 5 a.m. You probably go to bed at 1 o'clock. Yeah, I usually go to bed about 8. Okay, yeah, see, that's why. <laughs> I don't get off work till 11. Yeah. Uh, yeah, my, my, my body's not shut down like ready to go to bed until 12 30. I'm just, I'm out like a light about 8 o'clock. Usually, you know, you know, I'm not out like that. Yeah, that's why I don't get off work till 10 o'clock. Good luck, Joe. Come here, it's like a light. Like, it's so, I'm always, I'm like, until I. Until I was in high school, I was always an early bird, and I was always, I couldn't stay awake. And then in high school, you know, your friends start partying, and so I sort of switched. And through most of college, I was sort of, I had switched my um, circadian rhythm to be more, you know, night-oriented. And then when I hit 40, something happened, and it's just like, I'm, I'm exhausted at 8 o'clock, i got to go to bed. <laughs> if there's any child, like my niece or nephew involved, it's usually like 6 o'clock, and I'm just, I'm just like, they wear you out. Where you slept, man. I, I had to go to five games this last weekend. 
with my niece and nephew. My nephew is now playing lacrosse. I mean, you've seen like it's a violent sport. Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 it's enormously violent. Where is it? Where did you play? He plays in Plano. He lives in Plano, in Texas. So. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, it is, but they're, 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 it's violent. Yeah. Yeah. They have to yeah. hell out of each other with the stick. They do. <laughs> it's, it's, it's incredible. Um, but anyway, so all of this is to go back to the mood of the audience. A lot of people on the subway at 8 a.m. in the morning or earlier, because most people have to be at work by 8, are not in a great mood. And so that may impact your receptivity of the message. It may, it may negatively impact the way you receive the message. If you're being shoved on the subway and you see Sarah Jessica Parker and her, well, I, I don't think she's all that pretty, but a lot of people seem to think that she's, she's sexy and her you know, fabulous curls and makeup and done, you, you might like want to, I don't know, claw her eyes out at 8 in the morning as you're riding the subway and somebody's <laughs> shoving you. I just want to claw her eyes out because I don't like to. My sister calls my horse face. Uh, <laughs> she does kind of have a horsey face. I'm told that she's a rather nice individual. Does anybody like horses? I do like horses. <laughs> yeah, I'm not on women. <laughs> <laughs> the Outdoor Advertising Association of America has developed a new audience measure in 2010. So before it was just sort of based on the opportunity to see how many cars go by in a traffic count on an hour, and then we you know, count that over a 24 hour period and over seven days a week, and then we sort, of, uh, we sort of project out from there, right? Now they're trying to develop or they have come up with a more likely to see metric. And the new data includes things like eye tracking, circulation, traffic survey data, and they're combining it into one rating. And there are a number of other sources of information as well. The competitive media reports, experience sign and market research bureau provides some, and Geopath are some of the others that provide uh, some rating. But again, it's more difficult with this type than it is, say, if you have a banner ad and you can tell on on you know Facebook if somebody's clicking through and if they're actually responding to that ad and actually ordering your product. Um, promotional products marketing. The Promotional Product Association International, um, which is PAPI or PPAI, has a definition of what a promotional product marketing is, and it's the advertising or promotional medium or method that uses promotional products such as ad specialties, premiums, business gifts, awards, prizes, or commemoratives as part of the advertising. Specialty advertising is both an ad and a promotion. Um, all at the same time, usually. And it's used by a lot of nonprofits. I put this in here, so this is my own ad that, uh, this is my own ad to the text. It's used by a lot of nonprofits to overcome what's called the free rider problem. So, what is the free rider problem in economics? Whoever can tell me what the free rider problem is will get bonus points. Oh, we're historic. What is the free rider problem? When those who benefit from resources, public goods, and services and not pay them. Ah, very good. So what does that mean? We came up with the definition in order to get the full bonus points. What does it mean to be a free rider? Look at the definition and tell me what it means. So someone who's So people like you basically use like <laughs> Okay, well okay. So we're gonna do one of these. I'm getting my, my so yeah, everyone's better. <laughs> Sorry, I, okay, so your my, interpretation of the definition. My interpretation, I'm going to quote some of my extremist family members mm -hmm. from you know, Southeast of Oklahoma. But their free rider term in their mind is either, I don't believe this, but they're illegally free on the rents or drug addicts who use public welfare systems and aren't paying taxes to pay for them, so they're using other taxpayers' money. Okay. So Do that, that would be. I know. No, I know. Yeah, I know. yeah believe me. It's um, like it. That's not true. They're eligible for some benefits. You can't cut them off, for example. You can't yeah, deny them true. access to hospitals and medical care. Um, but by and large, on the whole, that's not. But yeah, I guess there is a free rider problem. Usually what you see in, in terms of what we're thinking about here, did, are, did you want to try? Yeah, so like, I know that like downtown, like uh, when we go downtown, nobody likes to pay for parking. So you usually pass them. Parking the big pass through parking. Mm -hmm. Well, now they've had associates say there that, like, hey, 
you have to be visiting Bass Pros. What you do is you park, show them, go inside, so, and then leave. And right. that's the free ride. So, yeah. So you, you're not totally a free rider in that instance because you are actually going inside and you might actually be influenced by that. So you're not a complete free rider. But complete free riders <laughs> are generally the ones who say, we're going to go ahead. Is it a problem that may occur when property rights are not clearly defined? Find or impose, and right. it is common with goods that are non excludable, including public goods, in situations of the tragedy of the commons. Yes, yeah. like so the tragedy of the commons. What is a public good? What is the tragedy of the commons? It's a term used in social science to describe the situation in a shared resource system where individual users acting independently according to their own self interest. Be Behave contrary to the common good of all users by depleting or spoiling that resource. Okay. So, we know about, like, so what does that mean, Chris? You're good at reading definitions, but what does it actually mean? <laughs> really well, let's see. We'll see if we can get Chris no. to play the game. Um, it means that you got a lot of people that are doing their own thing and acting for themselves, but a lot of people are doing that and leading to the depletion of the resource. Right. So by everybody acting within their own self-interest, it depletes the resource that they're utilizing. All right. Was that right? Tragedy of the body. I'm trying to find what it. What did you say? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 All those definitions, I'm like, what? No, no, I just want to figure it out. Well, what's it? The tragedy of the commons is like, it's used in no, social science. Um, but oh what happens is everybody like, is using, like everybody's acting in their own self-interest and using the resource. And by everybody doing that, it's hurting the greater good because yeah. the, the environment, so everybody using up our world's resources for corporate greed, and now we're all going to die. No, <laughs> capitalism runs the world. Capitalism so there are some goods which we Nobody think of can. as being public goods that it's difficult to exclude people. And there used to be a really cute um, game that you could play online called the Tragedy of the Bunnies. And what it did is it had these bunnies out in the field and it said, you're a bunny merchant, you make money by selling bunnies. And there are other bunny merchants in the game. And you were basically playing against um, a computer that had two players and you'd sit there and you'd zap all the bunnies, right? And at the end, in order to go on to the second round of the game, you had to have some bunnies left over to multiply. And in the first round where there are no fences, all the bunnies are gone before the second round can occur because you or the other players either zap all the bunnies. Whereas if you have finite resources that are private goods where they put bunnies in pens and say you can only take from the bunnies in your pen, you are more likely in the first round to save some bunnies so that you could have them for the second and third round because you're going to need them. Well, this actually occurred, the tragedy of commons as, um, actually occurs as a result of something that actually happened. It used to be that in New England states, and you can see this New York City, the Central Park was actually at one point in time there was a sheep common in New York City, and you could actually go and have dinner or lunch in, in the sheep common at a restaurant that's become very famous that's reopened recently, it closed for a while, and it's reopened, called Tavern on the Green. But what happens is you're a sheep herder, and you have this, this land that's set aside for everyone to graze. So what are you going to do? Well, you're going to put as many sheep as you can on there, as many sheep as you've got, and everybody else is going to put as many sheep as they can. Well, sheep are kind of like goats, if you've ever had a goat, I've had goats, we've had sheep and goats, we've raised all kinds of stuff. Um, they denude the area if they don't have a big enough area very quickly. And so what happens is you get dry lot problems with this, and that's the tragedy of the commons. Well, in terms of things like lobbying, the AARP is going to lobby for old people, and so they have an incentive not to join AARP and pay the dues because they know AARP is going to lobby on their behalf. That's a public good. It's going to affect what is what does AARP lobby for mostly? Well, they, they their big thing that they lobby for is Social Security benefits and Medicare. 
Those are the two big things that they actually lobby for. One of the reasons why, and you know, George W. Bush said he was going to privatize Medicare, and or not privatize Medicare, he's going to privatize Social Security. He was going to let you take some of your money out of Social Security and invest it so that you could get maybe a bigger rate of return. And like AR or went crazy, because what you're doing then is you're pulling money out of that trust fund. And the way Social Security works is it relies on younger workers to basically pay for older workers. And Social Security would be actuarially sound, by the way, if we would do two things. Stop dipping into the fund. One, well, three things then. We'd stop dipping into the fund. One is if we would raise the cap on Social Security taxable income. So currently the cap is set at something like $225,000. If you make over that, which my brother makes a lot more than that, you stop paying in. If we would just raise the cap, but not raise the benefits, Social Security would be actuarially sound for a lot longer. And then if we would allow more immigration in, because what does Social Security rely on? Young workers to pay for older workers. So one of the things Donald Trump just doesn't get when he talks about the horrors of illegal immigration is that immigration is a good thing. If you want to grow the economy, the only way you're going to grow it at a point that we're at is to have more immigration. Because people like me, I chose to have zero children. My brother and his wife chose to have two children. What does that mean in my family? It means we're not replacing ourselves. My brother and his wife are only replacing themselves. But our family is a net negative by one at this point, because I'm not choosing to. I chose not to have children. And that's becoming more and more common. Lots of couples, it used to be when I was growing up, it was very common, particularly I grew up in northern New Mexico, which is a largely Catholic area. Big families were very common. They're not common anymore, even among Catholics. They're not common. Why? Because kids are expensive. And so you have to, AARP is going to continue to fight for these things like, you know, keeping Social Security sound. And anyone who's over 65 is going to reap the benefits of AARP's lobbying because they're getting Social Security. So how do they overcome this? Well, they give you things. That's why I put this on here is that they, they give you things like what do you get as a private good, as a promotion from AARP for children. Well, you get a stupid hat that, you know, that's a red cap that looks kind of like Trump's MAGA cap. So it's like AARP instead of MAGA. Um, you get the calculator. You get discounts at hotels if you're an AARP member. You get discounts on airlines and travel. You get discounts on AAA insurance. You get discounts on um, Medicare GAP insurance if you're an AARP member. And those are private goods that you can't um, get without joining AARP. That's how they overcome the free rider problem. Well, they give you these little promotional things. The ASPCA does this. We've all seen the very sad song by Sarah McLaughlin, you know, with the arms of the angels. You all know what that song is about. I told you about what the song is about. It's about drugs. It's about drug use, people. Like, I'm, it sounds like I'm, this is one of my favorite activities. It's to figure out which songs are secretly about drug use? And that was it's the arm of the angel. It's PCP, right? Oh yeah, um, I, I need some. I need um, to on Storyteller, Sarah McLaughlin says she wrote that song about John Melvane, who I think was the guitarist for I want to say Smashing Pumpkins, but I may be wrong on that. And he overdosed in a hotel room, and that's what led her to write the song. And so it's about overdosing and drugs in a hotel room. Just like the Hotel California, the Hotel California is all about drugs. But it's a, it's a you know, the Sarah Blotton Angel song is sad and they have little puppies in the cages. And we all want to give, but we don't. So what do they do to get you? Well, you get the ASPCA blanket. You get the picture of your pet that you rescued, which they're copying Sammy's picture off, right? Over and over and over again, he said they would to you, I'm sure. Um, but you get these things that are promotional products that then encourage you to do it. So it's, they're used a lot by nonprofits. They're also used by things like banks. How many of you picked up the bank pen? You like the bank pen up there? I like the ones that are kind of curved that fit your hand. They're really nice. Banks were so much of them. I was steal them when I go in the bank and you know, deposit. So they're used for things like that. The advantages of promotional products. Selectivity. It's delivered to its desired recipient. 
If you're picking up the bank first pen, you're probably in the bank first lobby. You probably applied for a loan or you tried to open an account or something like that. There's a lot of flexibility. They are a wide variety of things to choose from in this area. What can you get? Well, at one point in time, when computers uh, and laptops were really starting to become every buddies, everybody had one. I remember that one of the big things that they'd give at every educational conference, because this was before we had access to really good web-based stuff, were those stupid jump drives. Every educators conference I went to, they were giving you jump drives so you could put your PowerPoints, because they were kind of expensive at the time. They, they're not anymore, but they were giving jump drives to everybody so that you could put your PowerPoints on and take them to class. People would, you know, board those jump drives. Um, those have sort of lost favor. What's the big thing that everybody wants now? Fidget spinners. They're giving away fidget spinners with stuff at all of these uh, places that we go. Oh, we have little pads, um, little white things for your phones, things like that. So you can um, have a wide variety of things to choose from. Stress balls. Stress balls are very popular now, at particularly education conferences. They give you those. When I took the bar, they gave us little stress balls that were in the shape of a gavel so that you could sit there and as you're taking the bar, you know, stress out. Um, the cost, some are very expensive, particularly if you're doing things like giving away pad folios or things like that. And banks do do that. Um, they can be really expensive and some are not. They can be cheap, like pens. What's an advantage, another advantage? They create a lot of goodwill. People like gifts. People like to get stuff. I, it's incredible to me. I, I go to these conferences. We'll have a big career fair at uh, ICSC, which Chris is going to next week with me. And there will be all kinds of giveaways. And like, I just don't pick up any of that crap anymore because I've got some, I don't want it. I'm like, it's just enough crap. I, I don't need more. But most people do. Like, it's amazing how many of our students will just like go and swipe handfuls of pens. I don't know why you don't ever write anything down, you know? And <laughs> I'm looking right now, some of you are not, like, everything I say is plangent, people. Plangent should be written down. But you give us a tool to go back and not be If you write it down, you remember it. That's, that's like, been proven. <laughs> it leads to high levels of recall of the brand and the message. And it's good to supplement with other media. So Bank First does traditional ads on television, right? They also have these stupid pins that they give away. If you go, what? I was just talking about all the free crap I take. Oh, you take all, all kinds of, yeah, okay. You almost left this, me because I have four shirts and two hats. The sunglasses, I do like the sunglasses. They're giving away sunglasses <laughs> a lot of that now. And I do like those because I have loose sunglasses. Four hats. So Bank First and gives away pins. Oh, they I also give it. away pad folios if you get a loan with them. Things like that, but they it supports their other stuff, which is the advertising on TV, their street signs and stuff like that. The disadvantages: your company's image may be cheapened if the product is chintzy or poorly designed and form. If it doesn't work, I am highly upset. I stole a pen the other day. They have all these pins. I'm in Thatcher Hall, which is the building that's right across the parking lot that might as well be the Sahara for some of you, because it doesn't matter how many times I say you should come see me and talk about your test. You don't want to watch the third floor of Thatcher Hall. Well, you have to go through the second floor, and that's the ROTC floor, which is housed in the college business. They have these little pens with the little um, stylus on the end. And I got one, because I was out of pens in my office, and it ran out of ink, like, almost instantly. Like, I like wrote three things. So I went down and stole another one, and I'll be damned with that. And now I have a very hostile feeling Towards the Army ROTC kill man because I walked downstairs twice and stole on a pen and, and it's just crap. So your image can be destroyed by cheaper, chintzier, poorly designed products or form. Um, saturation, the value to the receiver declines if the replacement is easily obtained. For example, pens, we all lose pens you know, frequently and we, we just pick up more. Um, the production time for some of these things can be significant depending on how complex the gift is, particularly if you're doing things like pad folios. And you have a very limited reach. It's not something that you can send out generally to everyone. So measuring promotional products, there's the text tell you there's no clearly established measurement system. 
There has been some ad hoc research that has shown that 70% have received, 70% of people have received some kind of promotional item in the last 12 months. I would think it's probably actually higher than that. Uh, it's just that people don't recall it. They don't recall picking up or swiping the pen at the bank. Um, that's just sort of out there. 88% said that they can recall the advertiser's name of those 70%. 83 said that they liked receiving promotional products. 38% said it's a constant reminder if you have the pen from bank first in your car that you're using to fill out deposit slips or whatever. Um, it's a constant reminder that you're a bank first customer. Uh, and 53% use a promotional product at least once a week. And 71% generally keep it. We have a tendency to keep things that are given to us. Yellow pages. So your text also talks about yellow pages. This was once a staple in every household and particularly for local businesses. That's how you found. How did you used to find plumbers? And electricians before Angie's list came about. Well, you actually picked up the yellow pages and you just started calling. You'd see what was the first plumber that would come um, and fix your, your toilet or whatever it was, or your, your electric, uh, if you needed something done. Um, and so it was a must for most local advertisers. Fewer and fewer people, though, are reaching for print ads. That's not true, or print versions of the yellow pages, particularly among traditionalists. But yellowpages.com has been increasing, and I find that hard to believe because I would use yp.com. Why the hell would you use it? All you, be, all you have to do is do what? Google. Yeah. You know, like you Plumber, have, Oklahoma City. Yellowpages.com yeah. got bought out. So, so I don't know why you why, 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 why anybody would use yp.com. It's not a SEO, and it's like a ranking system to pay for it. So that it helps yeah. you do your website SEO. Okay. Movie theater advertising. So this has become popular. Although the number of people going to the movies has been declining, but it's still a substantial number. I don't know why anybody wants to go to the movies. By the way, if you want to go see a movie that's out right now that features My Home, which was the, the backdrop for the movie, it's called Gosnell. It's, uh, they bill it as America's most prolific or biggest serial killer. You can go and see it at AMC. Um, Quail Springs, or I think it's currently playing in Tinseltown. I have not seen the movie yet because I'm waiting for it to come out on DVD or for uh, VOD because I don't like to go to movies. It's just a horrific experience. Wow, that bad. It's horrible. Oh, what, it's just, that? I think it's, so it's absolutely terrible. The last one, I mean, like, it's $85 for popcorn and four cups of candy. And the popcorn is got, I mean, like, they used to actually make popcorn. No, they just bring it in these big stale bags, and it's nothing but crumbs. It's just horrible. I mean, it's just it, it's just terrible. I don't, and then you're sitting there with every reject from the communicable disease ward that's hacking and coughing. Oh God! Oh. It's just it's a killing field. I don't know why you're going to the Adobe IMAX. The last movie we went to was actually my brother paid. For it. it was in Texas, and it's one of the movie suites where you can get full service now. You know, I, and that was okay. I, I could have a, 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 a bourbon and branch, and that was kind of nice, and some you know better food than that they have at the AMC Well Springs. But then, because I'd had the bourbon and branch and some better food, and the heat was seated, or the, the seat was heated, um, I fell asleep in the movie, and I can nap at home for free. So. Uh, it's a big waste of my time, but whatever. So a lot of people like to go to the movies. I can't figure out why. Wait until it's a video. I'm like your screen is better. Like you know, the, the curved TV that I have is far superior oh, so to all those. What's the purpose of the curved TV? You can see it from any angle. Yeah, you, you can't get a bad angle. It's not. It's not. If you look at most LED from like a, about a forty-five or ninety-degree angle, you can't see it. The curve, well, I feel like it would be kind of weird like from an, another angle. I feel like it would be good to curve. You can see it every angle. It's amazing. Trust me. I have a chair that's like right next to yeah. the curve, and like I can literally just look at the flag. Right, you can see it. There are some. You can movies. sit literally perpendicular to it and still see it. There are some movies that you watch in theater that you can only see that version of it because they don't release it the same on. You know, or whatnot. Yeah, and, and I guess there are some movies like the Harry Potter, those were basically ones that, because they're sort of epic, you want to see it on the big screen because it's just about the size, but very few movies in the point that I have to see. Marvel one. Yeah, 
Yeah, they, they have some theatrical versions that you can't, you don't want to see the theaters. That's not that big a deal. It's just, I, uh, I just don't go that much. Just Harry Potter. So, um, there are still a lot of you apparently that want to go to the movies. I can't imagine why. I mean, like, you can't wait through the Like, I can do multi, multiple things. Well, they did that Stubbs thing where you could just pay like 10 or $20 a month and you get unlimited movies. It's awesome. Right. Yeah. Credit, and and then if I don't like it, I don't feel cheated. I can just turn it off or go to the next one. I mean, it's great. So, people have an emotional uh, attachment. Um, to movie ads, apparently they say, and I put big question marks here because I find this hard to believe, that they're more engaged than TV, and I put like four question marks there, and I just, I totally disagree with this, because every time I've gone to the movies recently, and before nobody's paying attention to movie ads, they're paying attention to what? Their phones. Their phones, yeah. I mean, if you have the money to go to the movies now, you probably have the money to have a smartphone, and I don't think they're actually engaging with it. That used to be true before everybody had a smartphone. You sort of had to sit there and watch the ads because they were entertaining. Not so in an age of modern uh, technology. The cost is relatively low. Um, they say movie watchers pay attention again. That got like five or six question marks for me because I don't think you're paying attention. I think you're paying attention to your phone. You're, you're using those phantom vibrations as an excuse to check your phone. That's another thing. I just, I mean, like my phone starts vibrating in the movie, and I'm jumping, and I can't, I cannot get out of the theater fast enough. To go check my phone. It's, it's just crazy. I get drug addict. I guess I can see you in the theater twitching. I don't. I, 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 you're scared. 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 you generally fewer ads than you'll see in television. Proximity, the customers are often in the same location, so you'll see ads for things, for example, in the mall that you might go by. Segmentation, you're able to target very specific demographics. We know who goes to see the Disney films, right? It's generally families. We know who goes to see when Sex and the City was made into a movie, God help us all. Uh, we know who goes to see that, right? And you can advertise accordingly, so you can get a lot of specific demographic segmentation. The quality is generally pretty good, and you can have integration with things that are in the movie, right? You can integrate that. The disadvantage, some people say that it's, uh, it's irritating, they don't like it. And then the CPMs is higher than in other media in many instances. By the way, what does CPM stand for? It's cost per thousand, but thousand is not an M, is it? Million. No, it's cost per thousand. It's from the French Mille, M-I-L-L-E, um, cost per thousand. <laughs> Um, Non-traditional support media, branded entertainment, blends marketing and entertainment in things like television, film, music, and tech, and the brand is actually woven into the story. So, example, what's one of the most popular television shows right now about music? The Voice. The Voice is, yeah, that's right. I don't, know how, I don't know how the voices do that. Like they, they just have some of the worst contestants on that. Um, and the voice? Have, and then you have creepy little Adam Levine. Oh, God. It just makes my skin crawl. Um, Empire. How many of you have seen Empire? Right? That's like the music is blended into, and they sell what? The Empire soundtracks and things like that. Oh, didn't Nashville used to sell? Nashville also, yeah, came out with, with that. Product placement. This has been increasing tremendously. It used to be that they would put sort of generic things in a lot of movies, but now almost everything is a name brand item. So in James Bond, they used the Mercedes Benz AMG, they used the Mercedes Benz and a number of other things. And so, what is one of the most successful examples of product placement? There was a beer that nobody had ever, ever heard of until it was featured in a film called The Firm with Tom Cruise and Gene Hackman. They go down to Jamaica to meet a client, and he says, give me a red stripe. Nobody had ever, that was a microbrewery that existed, and only people who had gone to Jamaica knew about it. It all of a sudden went overnight 
It became a huge success. And then you started and something crazy ads. Yeah, it's one of the yeah. most successful product placements of all time. The other one was for my generation in a movie called E.T. And that was what? What was the product placement in E.T. that went viral? How did she lure? How many of you have seen E.T.? This is so hard. I mean, how did the alien out of the closet? It was like yeah. it's a yeah. Reese's Pieces. Reese's Pieces. Yeah. Reese's Pieces. Wow. I think, honestly, that's probably why I started eating Reese's Pieces. I used to watch E.T. all the time. I love it. 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 I love Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So product integration is not just product placement, it's where the product is actually woven throughout the program or becomes um, part of the program itself. Um, then you have uh, advertainment or adver games is the form of advertainment. So Burger King, McDonald's also has this, they've developed an online game that you can play and your kids then want to go to Burger King and they beg you, my niece and nephew, they, they love Burger King and their little game. Thank you, McDonald's. Um, and then content sponsorship. So for things like HGTV offers sponsorship to companies that uh, focus around building and remodeling homes, things like Home Depot. This old house used to be sponsored by Home Depot. And I think it was also sponsored by Craftsman when Bob Vila was there. Sears was a big sponsor of that. And so they had an event. I actually got to meet Bob Vila. He came to Guthrie because our, our store sold the most Craftsman as a part of a promotion. To, to get to, to see him. General Motors also is sponsored. Yeah, General Motors. That used to be really big. It, it was actually, you saw this in radio. There were They were shows that sponsored. Napo, for example, sponsored a Western series. Um, Ad-supported video on demand, which is a specialized content program, and it's offered online in some cable stations that are developed by advertisers. So it has the feel, for example, like a talk show, um, but it's actually a uh, ad advertisement that's a bit increasing. The advantages of branded entertainment. You can get to uh, a large number, for example, a large number of people see movies every year. You have an opportunity for repeat exposure. So the BMW, for example, one year, I would think it was when Pierce Brosnan was the James, when Pierce Brosnan was James Bond. Um, they released the, the Mercedes, or not the, I'm sorry, the BMW, that was basically his car, and that was seen throughout the movie. You get source association. TV celebrities using the product may lead to positive feelings, particularly if you have positive feelings or positive associations with that star actress. Although it could, the same can also be true if you have a negative association. So, you know, in Sex and the City, I don't know, Sarah Jessica Parker was wearing Victoria's Secret. I'd probably like run screaming <laughs> from the room from the Victoria's Secret store. But um, the cost is often low because obviously movies are not about product placement. It's just maybe a, an additional source of revenue, or it may be free. It may be done in trade. Recall shows that there may be higher recall than TV ads because of zipping and zapping and getting uh, up and going. Know, you're doing something else. Um, it can also bypass regulations. What's one of the things that happened with Mad Men Cigarette? Companies can't advertise anymore because 46 states have banned it in all sorts of forms. For a long time, they couldn't advertise on television, they couldn't advertise on the radio. So they advertised in print media and then they advertised um, on billboards. Now, as a result of the tobacco lawsuit, they were banned from any kind of advertising at all in those kinds of media. But what did they do? Well, Mad Men came out and it's the 19th. Uh, 50s and 60s, the heyday of advertising, and everybody is smoking and drinking, and they're smoking in their offices. And so, you know, it can be um, a way of getting around regulations to do that. Um, consumers generally view these kinds of placements favorably. And you may reach consumers with a strong interest in the subject matter. <clears throat> So Bond movies, you have a high interest in what? What's all, every Bond movie is about what? High-tech gadgets, fast cars, and what else? Fighting and sex. Yeah, yeah, whatever. And so you have a strong emotional attachment to the subject matter. And the BMW that Bond drove is, you know, it's seen as cool. You want to imitate that. 
the disadvantage, it may have actually high absolute costs. Um, so it may seem like it's cheaper, but high absolute costs in terms of the number of people you're uh, going to get to. Time of exposure. If the product appears in a scene that makes people uncomfortable, they may have a negative reaction to it and may carry over to uh, an image of the product itself. It may have limited appeal. Unlike advertising that you pay for, um, you may have lack of control, or traditional advertising that you pay for, lack of control of when the ad is seen in the movie. Um, competition. The appeal has led to an increase in competition to get one's products placed. And it may appear, like I said, in scenes that viewers dislike. If somebody's enjoying a refreshing, God-given Anheuser-Busch Bud Light product in the slasher hacker movie, and then all of a sudden they get their head cut off, you might have a negative association with Bud Light at that point. And it can be lost in everything else that's going on. If the car that James Bond uses is, is seen a lot, you're probably going to avoid the clutter, but if it's just passing in one thing or a short scene, um, it may be lost with all the other products that are there. Measuring branded entertainment, Nielsen Media Research tracks placements on networks and plans to track them on cable in the future. Brand channel product placement provides information on what's going on in the industry. It's not as um, scientific, um, but it does provide some idea of what's going on. And Red Track is attempting to measure uh, results-oriented integration product placement. But at this point, it's still very tenuous in terms of actually measuring your ROI on this stuff. The text talks about guerrilla marketing, and there are a variety of tactics here. And one of the things that I, it's a good movie, if you haven't seen it, The Joneses with Demi Moore. This is the ultimate in guerrilla marketing. I don't think anybody's actually done this, but what they are is they're a fake family that moves into an affluent community. They're basically paid to be walking, talking promotions for whatever uh, the companies that hire them want them to. So the clothing that they wear, the driver that he uses on the golf course, the car that he drives. Um, it's kind of an interesting movie. You can see this maybe actually having people be, being paid to be walking, talking product spokesmen. Like they are on YouTube. Yeah, they are. That's that's how um, a number of people have become actually uh, fairly big stars on YouTube. Or on, at the at the early age, it was called Vine, yeah. and that's um, there are two brothers. Their last name is Paul, but have become internet oh, celebrities for that. And I'm out of time, and I finished just in time. So good deal. I don't have to. Sal, we'll be wrong. Keep you late to give you your funny story next time. Um, they made a